Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And I'm Ingrid Ackerman, a junior studying environmental engineering here at Stanford. And we have with us uh, Jonathan Bender, professor at the Graduate School of Business and at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, and Professor Steve Callender from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. This past weekend, we had a conference on the political economy of environmental sustainability, sponsored by both the Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And there were some amazing papers given, a lot of dialogue. Ingrid, you were at the conference. You asked some great questions. In fact, what did you come away with in terms of questions for uh, Steve and John? Sure. My, my biggest question is what's the one most important thing that came out of this conference for you? So I think one idea that came up uh, several times during the conference in several papers is the idea that uh, in the old days, for example, Kyoto Protocols, the idea was that a green coalition would form and countries that weren't part of the coalition would essentially free ride on the, uh, on the green states. And what does uh, it mean to free ride on that, Free John? ride basically means that they would not engage in extensive decarbonization, that they would continue uh, using fossil fuels business as usual, which was a term that came up uh, repeatedly, and keep pumping CO2 and, and other greenhouse gases into the, into the atmosphere. And that was that. So the, the green countries would get together, they'd sign a protocol, they'd do what they could, and the other countries would just do business. Well, that just seems like a flaw in the... Yes, absolutely a flaw. And, and uh, several of the, of the papers argued that, in fact, it was a foregone opportunity doing that. Uh, and that the countries that weren't part of the coalition could be offered incentives to change their behavior. So, for example, linkage with trade issues. So, uh, certain trade deals would be approved if and only if uh, the countries that weren't part of the Green Coalition would uh, start to uh, decarbonize, start to ease off on fossil fuels, and so forth. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. This was uh, a big takeaway for me as well, because prior to the conference, I thought if we can't get everyone on board, say with the Paris Agreement, it's a wash. But what came out of this conference was that, no, the people inside of that agreement can provide incentives to the outsiders exactly. and still make it work um, and incentivize a green transition. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Steve, on, on your side, I mean, what did you see as uh, some of the big uh, takeaways from the conference? Yeah, it was a great conference, Bill. Uh, the big takeaway for me was just how central politics is to environmental sustainability. It was really striking looking at issues of in sustainability from a variety of angles, how it always came down to the one common blockage, and that was politics. We've made remarkable progress on the science of environmental sustainability. We've made remarkable progress on the technology and the implementation. Right? But the blockage, the problem in all of these domains is solving the political problem. So it was just fantastic to come to a conference and bring together these experts on environmental sustainability and connect on this common problem and, and try to make progress. And that was a really inspiring part of the conference for me. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a complex issue. I don't know, you know, we certainly don't have all the answers in regards to how we'll get through the sort of the political blocks, but I think we have a lot of like action items going forward that we can try now um, in the political space. What do you think about that, Bill? Well, I'm wondering, I mean, we know it's a block. Uh, is there a way we can design our way out of this? So I, I think Steve made a really good point. That, that really was the overriding theme. That is that we need to be hard-headed not only about the economics of uh, sustainability, but the political economy of sustainability. So a, a good example of this was for 100 years, literally 100 years, the favorite policy recommendation of economists is if you have an externality, you should tax the use of that externality. So an externality would be something like releasing carbon that, that uh, is harmful to the environment. Exactly. Uh, this, this is a, a huge externality problem. So the economists just say tax it. 
Uh, and it's a very elegant solution. Uh, but the problem is, is that if you look at the data and one of the papers did, it's very hard to impose gas taxes. And if you impose them, it's hard to keep them there. It's hard to stabilize them because folks don't like them. Consumers slash voters don't like them. Uh, so one of the theory papers said, well, actually, you know, you can impose taxes on the supply side, not just on the demand side, gas taxes and demand side. Uh, and imposing it on, on the supply side might be politically much more feasible than imposing it on the demand side. But I, I really like your point there that something that came up in, the, up in the conference is that, like, let's not beat a dead horse. We've tried implementing a, a carbon tax for so many years. And it's just not feasible. It's not politically going to get across. Um, so why don't we shift and try and add taxes on the supply side or do something like a cozy and bargain and try and use mixed um, fine or blended financing to instead um, essentially internalize this externality? Well, that's interesting. Other things that you took away from it, Steve? That's right. I, I ultimately came away from the conference very inspired. What I concluded was we just need to, we need to get creative and we need to get smart about solving this political blockage. We've got smart on the technology, we've got smart on the science, we need to get smart and creative on coming up with solutions to this political problem. And a great example of this was on the trade issues. So a big a concern or constraint on environmental sustainability is that even if we solve the problem here in the United States and in the developed world, are, is all we're doing shifting that pollution to the developing world. And this is a problem in that it degrades the quality of the air and the environment in the developing world, but it also is a problem in that the sources of energy and the methods of production in the developing world are let's just say, sort of not as clean as they are here in the United States. And so by shifting uh, pollution to the developing world, we're not only sort of imposing it upon these people, but we're actually increasing the world supply. And this is an issue because we love trade. We want trade to happen. It makes the world more productive, makes us more efficient, and it increases our wealth. But, but that just seems like a really unfair consequence. It really is an unfair consequence, yeah, absolutely. And so what we need to do is we need, and it's bad for everybody, it's bad for us here in the United States if there's more pollution happening somewhere else because this air, this air floats all, all around the world. So what we need to do, and this is the essence of political problems, is coming up with, I know it's a cliche, but win-win solutions. How can we design political institutions? And in this context, how can we design international trade agreements that ensure that the outcome is, is good for everyone. Right? And it's good for everyone without giving up on trade, without giving up on the benefits of trade. Can that be done? Well, it hasn't been done. Right? But what I learned at the conference, and this uh, trade was a, a fixture in several of the papers, but particularly the, the last paper of the conference that we wrapped up with by Professor Bard Harstad from the University of Oslo, he spoke about how to design these international trade agreements in a way to solve this problem. In, Without getting into the details too much, the core idea is to build in contingency. Contingency in the sense that we here in the US and in the developed world will, tr will trade with the developing world, but only if production is done in a certain way. Now, previously, we've just sort of left it up to each country to figure out how to do this. But by linking the trade agreement to environmental policy, Domestically, we can link the domestic motivations in the US and in the developing world and create a system where we can leverage the benefits of trade, but do so without degrading the quality of the environment. Right? And that's sort of challenging to do, but we need to get creative about coming up with this sort of agreement. And I came away from the conference inspired by the opportunities for that creativity and to see it, to see it beginning in the academic world. Boy, that's so powerful. We so we came up with, or we heard about this idea at the conference, CTAs, Contingent Trade Agreements. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do we think we can now implement this? Like, where do we take this idea and turn it into action? So one sweetener uh, added to what Steve was talking about uh, is that apparently the economic benefits from conditioning trade and other uh, issue areas uh, to uh, environmental progress is that there might be very large economic benefits from doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, and heretofore, most of the studies on decarbonization have fo focused on the economic costs. 
Uh, and that's quite striking. You say, well, okay, I mean, the, the costs are there, they're real, but what about the benefits? So one of the papers uh, took a hard-headed stab at uh, estimating the economic benefits from ending coal use and switching over to renewables, wind and, uh, wind and solar. And those are new technologies, and learning by doing means that the costs of renewables have been coming down and will continue to keep coming down for quite some time. Whereas the costs of, uh, of accessing coal, producing coal, and using coal as an energy source are basically more or less flat, more or less uh, constant. So there are huge economic benefits from switching over. The problem for the developing world is that this requires a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. It's the switching problem, the transitional problem, uh, and so, well, let's take these, issue, these two issues and put them together, namely let's condition financial aid, the blended financing grid that you referred to before, let's condition that on the recipient country terminating its coal plants. Oh, interesting. Let's make a deal. And the deal actually will be win-win. That's because the, the amount of greenhouse gases globally will go down a lot if these medium-sized countries, uh, China, India, Brazil, and, uh, and so forth, start terminating their coal plants. Uh, and in, a, uh, in addition, they'll be getting the financial aid to make the, uh, to make the transition. So that's, that's a win-win negotiation. A real sweetener. You know, it's interesting. These ideas are powerful, and you know, hearing them, I just want policymakers to be able to move right to execution of these ideas, and yet um, that's sometimes hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ingrid, your generation will be taking over the leadership of the world in the next decade, uh, and um, I hope that. Uh, the current generation gets this done, but if they don't, it's going to be up to you. And I think, I think there's a lot of movement in the space now, but something we saw throughout the conference is this sort of discounting of the future, where people are focused on what's going on right now, and the current economy, all of our current issues, but we know that this is in the pipeline, this is going to impact my generation, the generations following. And so we need to put effort on coming up with these solutions that John was talking about and implementing them now. And it's not an easy thing. Um, so you were talking about this sort of win-win solution that involves financial aid and conditional trade agreements, and that's, that's optimal, but there's a lot of normative things that go into it. Um, so. The politics of yeah, it is it's, complicated. It's, it's not so easy. So, so if, if I could mention another theme here, which is uh, not, not as upbeat as what we were just talking about. And it, it's along the lines of the future. It has to do with, with the future. Not only do we discount the future, which is normal, but in democracies there's an important fact, which is that subsequent generations don't vote. Your generation votes, of course, but the generation after that doesn't vote. The generation after that certainly doesn't, doesn't vote, which means that it can be difficult making deals that have long-term payoffs. And climate change, you know, climate change is, is obviously one of those. So one of the theory papers, I thought one of the, one of the most striking uh, papers in, uh, in the conference, made the argument that the threat of climate catastrophe actually is an impor important and probably will continue to be an important motivator for getting things done. Mm. Uh, actually experiencing wildfires in California and terrible hurricanes in Florida and flooding in Pakistan and so on and so forth makes all of this real today, now. And that's the way human beings work. I mean, we can talk all we want about what would be optimal, but if the way we work, if attention is focused on, oh my gosh, things are really getting bad now, 
that's that's a very important. That's an, you know it, that's a, that's an interesting point. Uh, this this issue of discounting the future, Steve, have you thought about this much? Yeah, absolutely, Bill. It's a it's a common commonly understood. It's a long running theme in political economy research about the myopia of politics today. That politicians are looking no further than the next election, and so policy is constrained by the current electoral s cycle. And so a big theme in political economy research is trying to understand the impact of that myopia and, and how can we design institutions and how this affects policy making given this, uh, given this view of the world. And what we saw at the conference was how primary this constraint is to issues of environmental sustainability. And so I think going forward, combining what we know in political economy about this myopia, about this issue in politics, and trying to apply that knowledge to the environmental problem to help solve this blockage uh, that we see in, in, in many areas, I think is an exciting avenue for future research. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing what we can learn and how we can contribute to this problem. Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, that's great to hear. So our thanks to you, uh, Professor Steve Callender, Professor John Bender, thanks so much for coming. Ingrid, until the next conference. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.